On today's episode, we have Mike Matthews. He is the founder and owner of Legion Athletic Supplements. He created Legion to bring something unique to the sports supplement space. Ten years later, Legion is the number one best-selling brand in all natural sports supplements, with over 800,000 customers served and 4 million bottles sold. Legion has a commitment to science, transparency, and honesty, as well as their dedication to providing the knowledge and tools people need to achieve their fitness goals. Mike has published over 10 books with more than 2 million copies sold and is the best-selling author of Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, Thinner, Leaner, Stronger, and Muscle for Life. Mike also hosts his own podcast, Muscle for Life with Mike Matthews, and has over 35 million downloads, and each episode gives you a simple, science-based know-how and inspiration that will help you build your best body in life. Welcome to the show, Mike Matthews. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Pre- appreciate the intro. <laughs> you have lots of accolades to be able to pull from, <laughs> so it was pretty easy to put together. But today, uh, we are going to be going over an overrated versus underrated episode, and And being able to do it with more of a supplement focus, which I thought would be a really good conversation to be able to pull from. So starting off, overrated or underrated? Yohem Bean. What's the general consensus on it? I mean, funny, I was going to say, if we're going to talk supplements, then probably the default answer should be overrated for basically (laughs) everything because of just the nature of the supplement industry where um, most supplements are are overhyped and and oversold. I think that's just generally true. And the reason for that is because it works, because there there is a a segment of the market that is not not stupid, just ignorant. And, And I was that person at one point as well. So when you first get into the supplement space, you're unsophisticated as a consumer and you take a lot of claims at face value and you end up buying a lot of things that you don't need or that just don't do anything. And so um, with something like Yohimbean, I'd have to say, honestly, it's probably generally overrated simply because it's in connection with fat loss, which is a big hot button selling point. Um, anything related to body composition it gets people's attention. I mean, that's, that's the, that is the number one goal for most people who are doing anything in terms of exercising or dieting first and foremost they're they're wanting to look a certain way and and there's nothing wrong with that i mean that's still at least 50 percent of the reason why i still do it is i like to look a certain way um i've come to appreciate other aspects of it but um but if we look at yohimbin it's uh it's interesting in that there there's limited research on it um the research i would say does support its use and support its mechanism of action which is basically to to make it simple a fat cell has two different types of receptors it has a receptor that when um a a, a chemical uh called a catecholamine like uh, epinephrine or norepinephrine, when it binds with that receptor, it releases the fatty acids or releases some of the fatty acids in the fat cell to be burned. So that's good. That That's what we need to mobilize the energy stored in a fat cell. But then there's another type of receptor that will also bind to these catecholamines. And when that receptor uh, binds, then nothing happens. There is no release of the fatty acids to, to be burned. And so um, the the uh, yohimbine, what it does is it will bind to the receptors that basically put the brakes on the uh, fat mobilization. And so it doesn't directly burn fat. Uh, It may, because it's a stimulant, it may impact the metabolic rate. There's, There's mixed evidence on this. It's unclear just because, again, there's not a lot of research on yohimbine, um, but there's enough to know how it can benefit. And so primarily it it appears to allow the body, uh, to, um, better mobilize fat cells. And we also know that certain fat cells have more of these, um, they're, they're called alpha and they're called beta receptors. And so alpha receptors are the, the go receptors and beta receptors are the stop receptors. And so fat cells uh, in our body have different proportions of the fat mobilizing receptors and the um, 
fat immobilizing receptors, so to speak. And so that helps us understand the stubborn fat phenomenon that we've all experienced. If you've ever dieted down to a lean level, then you know that you tend to get lean in certain areas of your body fairly quickly. And there are other areas that just take their time. It just takes, uh, sometimes it feels like an inordinate amount of time to finally lose the last bits of fat in different areas of your body. Typically in men, it's the lower abdomen uh, area, and you kind of just kind of wrap that around the, the entire body. That's typically, uh, in men, that's where we, that's where we hold fat the longest in women. It's usually hips, thighs, but, but there are exceptions to that. So fat distribution patterns can differ from person to person, but generally that's, that's how it goes. And so then what you can do is, especially if you've been dieting for a bit, and now you have, let's say the, the areas that get lean faster are pretty lean. You've lost a fair amount of fat in your face. You've lost a fair amount of fat in your upper body. And what you are now working to get rid of is mostly, not, not entirely, but mostly this, this stubborn fat or these stubborn fat deposits, then yohimbine can be particularly helpful in that scenario uh, just to help your body better uh, mobilize those fat stores, which are resistant. That doesn't mean you need yohimbine or any other supplement. Um, another supplement that has a similar effect is synephrine, uh, which is, um, I would say, um, it, it, it's less flashy maybe than yohimbine. Uh, you, don't, you don't see it uh, touted as much as yohimbine. So maybe, maybe it's not overrated, but it is a supplement that I think is worth considering. Um, for anyone who knows ephedrine, this is think of it as a as a natural kind of analog uh, of of ephedrine, and uh, so that has a similar effect. And so that's I mean that's that's what yohimbine can do for you. And in terms of bottom line, okay, how much faster can I lose fat, or how much more fat can I lose? Um, I mean, it's hard to put a, put a number to it. It's not a big number. It's certainly not. And in a best case scenario, if you're just talking about yohimbine, although I would say you should probably include caffeine because there's a, there's probably a synergistic effect and you're probably using caffeine anyway. So, um, you might as well combine those things and you may want to consider synephrine as well, uh, that those three together, uh, I think makes sense. Um, it, in a best case scenario, maybe an extra two pounds or so pound to two pounds of fat loss per month. So long as, uh, let's say, you know what you're doing with your diet <laughs> is, is probably reasonable. <laughs> yeah. Which is, is probably reasonable. And, um, I, I yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be comfortable saying any, anything beyond that. And so then it's just, uh, it's a matter of the cost versus the benefits. Is that worth it to you? Is it worth the the amount of money that you'd spend, not that it's a large amount of money, but you're going to spend some money. And, um, that's about it in terms of costs. There aren't any negative, uh, f like health effects that you need to be concerned about. Some people don't tolerate Yohimbine well. Uh, some people find that they get very jittery and that it doesn't go away. Um, it's, it's common to maybe experience a little bit of that when you first start taking it, but then typically you habituate to it pretty quickly. And then you, you might feel a little bit of a stimulant effect, but that's it. Um, so yeah, that's my spiel on <laughs> Yohimbine. One of the few natural supplements that can help you lose fat faster. There aren't, there aren't many in terms of direct mechanisms that can aid as opposed to maybe something that maybe it dials down your hunger, which is great. Um, and that's useful, but it's, it's a little bit different than something like yohimbine that it's not directly burning fat, but it is, we could say, making your body more efficient in its fat burning. Yeah. And there's a, one main thing that you said in there that I want to highlight is you said after you've been 
in a diet or losing fat for a little bit of time to then consider it, which I 100% agree with basically everything you said here of just that oftentimes people are really drawn in by anything that is fat loss related. And they're like, okay, this is going to be my magic pill. And it's in a pill, so it's perfect for me. I'm going to take this and then see all of my fat loss dreams come true. But I really use it with clients or for myself when it's like, okay, you've dieted for a good period of time. Maybe you only have four or six weeks left on the diet and you are trying to get rid of that last little bit of stubborn fat. But it 100% needs to be paired with correct diet and correct um, just calorie expenditure to even get that. It's not going to be, okay, if I just keep calories the same, I keep everything the same, and I add this in, magically I'm going to see all of these results that I want to see. And then the second thing I wanted to mention is I just love where you own a supplement company that sells a supplement that has yohimbine in it, and you could very easily say, this is awesome, you should use it, buy this product now. But that's something where even in the articles on Legion, you talk about that you created Legion to be able to bring something unique to the sports supplement space because the last thing that the world needed was yet another line of flashy, hyped up, bogus pills, powders, and potions. And I think that that's something that I relate to so heavily within Legion and why I've been with Legion for seven years is because it's something where you guys are very evidence-focused and based. And it's not just, here, sell the supplement, buy this thing. It's let's learn about what this is doing so then we can make an informed decision on if this is going to be the best product for me or even if I need those products because it's also correct that supplements are supplementary and they are not vital for what we have in place. Can they add an aid to our goals and our results? For sure, but they aren't 100% needed to be able to see the results that you want to see, but they can be helpful as a whole. Yeah, and one thing to add to um, what you just said is from the beginning, I've put a lot of emphasis on education. I mean, I started for 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 people listening who don't know. I started writing books. That's that's how I I started in this in this line of work. And so my personal focus and really the work that I've enjoyed the most over the years is has been educational uh, in nature. I I really do like writing in particular, but I've also enjoyed um, doing the podcast. And those are basically the two written and then. And then podcasts are kind of like the two main uh, channels that that I've worked in in the educational work. And so when I started Legion, that was uh, that was my my personal focus. And so naturally, it just gets kind of infused into the DNA of the company. And um, when when you look at our product pages, for example, it's it's very educational compared to the norm for for sports nutrition. It's light on, um, I mean, there, there is some salesmanship. I understand that uh, yeah. for the business to exist, <laughs> but people, people have to buy things and that does require selling to some degree. Uh, and, and that means that, yes, you do need to make some claims about benefits and efficacy and things. But uh, I've, I've tried to also incorporate education on these products, on the ingredients to also set the right expectations which is uh, which is very important for I mean multiple reasons. You could start with just I think it's a good business practice to have people buying products with realistic expectations because acquiring customers is very expensive, uh, whereas retaining customers and um, reselling to to customers you've retained that's very inexpensive uh, through different means. Um, in, in some cases, people, they just come back themselves and they just rebuy. You don't even have to resell them. Uh, and then in cases where you are reselling or you're cross-selling something like email marketing, which we do a lot of, and that that's a, a significant source of revenue for us, it's very inexpensive. So it's acquiring that customer is, is that's, that's where uh, a lot of the, the marketing expense in any business is. And so if you, if you get a new customer, and you essentially lie to them about what they can expect from the product. And so you set their expectations very high, unrealistically high. And then they're almost guaranteed to not have that experience, especially if it's a body composition thing where you can't really even count on a placebo effect because they need to see results. They need to see 
faster fat loss. They need to see faster progress in the gym or bigger muscles as opposed to maybe like a nootropic where it's more subjective. Do you mm-hmm. feel like you are smarter? Do you feel like your <laughs> brain engaged, is working better? More focused. Yeah, do you, exactly. <laughs> do, you, do you feel like your mood has improved? Well, maybe you never know. Um, and so, so I think it's good marketing to, uh, to, to educate people on what is this product comprised of ingredient by ingredient, what benefits are supported by good research and, and, um, communicating those things without unnecessary hype and salesmanship. Like, yes, sell, but just state the, the facts as they are and, and then let people set their own expectations based on, uh, in, in our case, it's really just focusing on the scientific evidence, the weight of the evidence on each of these ingredients, um, based on high quality research that anyone can, can review. It's all cited. And so I think it's good business. And then, and then I think it's also just being a good person. Mm -hmm. I, I just fundamentally disagree with lying for a living. I just disagree with it. And, and take, take a, a supplement. This is, I think it's on your list, but if if we can jump to it quickly, Mm -hmm. Uh, it's very popular electrolyte supplements, right? And this is something we get asked about frequently. The most common requests we get are electrolytes, um, BCAAs, uh, EAAs, and probably a testosterone booster. Um, those and, and, and a standalone creatine, which we actually are going to do because that's that's worthwhile. But the other ones are not. And in the case of electrolytes, could uh, could Legion sell a lot of electrolytes? Yes. I mean, if we set aside the the mismatch with the brand because electrolytes, I wish I could sell an electrolyte supplement. I was telling you offline, I did a pretty extensive review of, of the existing literature myself. I reached out to other people who know a lot more about this stuff than I do, um, uh, PhDs, professors, and, and basically was saying, hey, would you mind looking through this and, you know, I can pay for your time if necessary. And, and here's my conclusion. Uh, am I wrong? I would like to be wrong, <laughs> but am I wrong? And, and so the consensus, um, is, is no, 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 I'm, I'm not wrong that these supplements are completely useless for most people. I mean, sure. If you have somebody who does ultra marathons, uh, here in Florida in August or something, they, they may want to make sure that they're um, ingesting quite a bit of sodium. Uh, maybe there are a couple other minerals they want to mix in. There. I mean, they don't need a, an electrolyte supplement per se, but yeah, they may want to be supplementing with electrolytes in certain circumstances, not even necessarily every day, but maybe when they go on their, their, you know, hundred mile, uh, 36 hour <laughs> run, like, yeah, during that period and maybe some of their longer and tougher training blocks, uh, it would help. But for, the vast majority of the people listening to this podcast and the vast majority of Legion's customers who are working out a few hours per week, getting a getting sweaty, but uh, they're not sweating, they're not losing ten pounds in sweat, you know, over like a twenty four hour period or whatever. Um, there's just there's just no utility at all. The and so uh, companies that are selling electrolyte supplements, making claims about hydration. I mean, that's just a red flag term at this point. Um, and, and, and performance, mental performance, physical performance, basically any claims that are made to sell these supplements, it's just outright lying. Uh, one company, a big company reached out to me, ironically asking if I wanted to promote their electrolyte (laughs) supplement. And, uh, they just didn't even know that I had a supplement company. So I, I replied and I just said, Hey, I don't know if, you probably don't know this, but I actually have a supplement company. And ironically, I don't sell an electrolyte supplement. And here's why. Here's an article that I wrote explaining why I don't. And then they said, oh, yeah, cool, cool. We have a science page too here if you want to check it out. <laughs> and I looked at it. And yeah, yeah, a, a, sci- a science a science page. <laughs> um, and so I, I view that personally as just lying uh, for a living. That's it. It's just lying to people to make money. And does that work? Yeah, absolutely. It can work really, really well. I mean, it, it actually, uh, it, it appears in some ways, if you only care about making money, it's almost like a cheat code because people generally 
uh, it's not, I don't even think that, I don't know if it's that people are generally gullible. I think it might be more that people generally just give other people the benefit of the doubt. I think most people are just good people. Uh, we're, we're all kind of messed up in our own ways, but uh, we, we generally trust, we generally take other people at face value. And, um, and so if you have, um, if you have an explanation for something like, um, like an electrolyte supplement that makes sense, and I'm putting that in air quotes for people listening, it may not be true, but you can follow the logic and it makes sense. And if maybe the person explaining it, uh, does a good job explaining it, maybe they're well-spoken, maybe they have some credentials. I mean, that, that's enough to to convince a lot of people that the product works as claimed. And then you add in um, some other marketing activities, you add in a lot of influencers to, to create a lot of buzz and to, to give the appearance that everyone is using these, these supplements, especially on social media because of how algorithms work. Uh, you, you can, if you're s- strategic in, in how you select your influencers, you can, you can almost like um, enclose segments of the market. So you have a bunch of people who all follow uh, uh, a, a group of of people. They're they're and, and so if you get the right influencers, then you can create the appearance for a lot of consumers that your stuff is everywhere because they just keep on getting fed by the algorithm um, influencers who now you're working with, and so. Uh, there are there are companies that even that's that's part of their pitch is they help you do that type of analysis of which are the key influencers that you would want to work with to create that uh, illusion so to speak and so i i just personally disagree with that strongly um and so i mean that that also has kind of informed how i've gone about uh doing business with legion and passed up opportunities to make a, a lot of money. I mean, electrolytes would be, would be a big seller huge for us. Huge margins. Yeah. Yeah. Huge margins. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's, it's basically just salt. So, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's salt. Uh, and, and yeah, that's, that's mostly it. And then you just mark it up like 15 times and, and there's your product. Um, BCAAs and, and, and the same goes for, for the other uh, supplements that I mentioned. Yeah, Legion's website is a wealth of information. I refer people to it all the time because there is not only great information on the supplements, being able to outline what they do, which I very strongly agree that other brands and their websites do not make it easy. Like I have even gone, um, whether it's clients asking about a product or I see a product and I'm just interested of like, okay, what what's it about? Let me look into it a little bit. Even to find the supplement facts of what is included in this is really hard. I have to click around a lot of places where Legion, it's okay, the picture of the product, you scroll once, there's the supplement facts. You scroll down, here's what's in it, here's why it's in it, and here's all of the articles cited that tell you why we put it in it. And also here's our thoughts on why we put it in it. So I refer people to that very often. And I find it very illuminating. Again, when I go to these other sites, and it's like, I can't even find what's in this product, let alone if any of these claims are true whatsoever. Because marketing is, as a consumer, marketing is very hard to navigate. Because for me, I think like you said, of why would someone lie about this? Because I can't imagine lying about a product that I put out, like with anything within, whether it's our coaching, whether it's our um, our band tees, whatever it may be, I can't imagine sitting there telling you it does this for you and it doesn't. So then I think, oh, other people aren't going to do that either. But turns out people do do that. Um, but I strongly <laughs> Un- <remember>. Unfortunately, <laughs> yes. many, many people yes. are just mostly motivated by money. Unfortunately, yes. that's kind of how, uh, that, that's just the way of the world, unfortunately. <laughs> yes. And I remember being, uh, walking through like a vitamin shop And I would get drawn in by so many products because, again, their marketing, the claims that they had, or even just the um, 
what pictures they had on like, let's say the protein uh, containers. And I'll be like, oh my gosh, that's going to taste so good. And then you get it and it tastes like absolute dog shit. Yeah. But even that's a like, good what? point. It's, it's still, that, I mean, that's, it's, it's almost false advertising. Yeah. And it's, not, it's not like they, they don't know that their protein tastes terrible. Of course they know that it tastes terrible. But you know, they're going to still sell it like it does. Yeah. Even, even to that point, just a, a quick comment on the electrolyte. So this was an internal discussion with several employees um, who are also involved in the in the product creation process because it's not it's it's not just me. I mean, it never was just me. Early on, uh, I had the help of his name is Curtis Frank, and so he he is the or is was he's not affiliated with Examine anymore. So I guess it's was, but he was the co-founder of Examine.com, and um, he he created all of the material in the beginning. So the first several years of Examine was just him. Uh, and so extremely knowledgeable and I was he has a lot uh, of great articles on Legion's website as well. Yeah, he does, <laughs> yeah. I, un unfortunately, uh, he wanted to keep working together, but he just had some personal issues that he had to deal with. And so, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that we couldn't keep working together because I, I liked working with him. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so with the electrolytes, I, I remember one person coming at it more from the angle of like, okay, so agree that we're not going to make false claims. We're not going to do that. But this is a very popular category. And so what if we sold an electrolyte supplement and we just didn't make any of those false claims and we, we made uh, maybe it's weak claims. Um, but, but the implication was that we're going we're gonna to ride this wave we're gonna, which is created by all these other false claims that are out there. So people have heard these things about electrolytes up and how they, even if we just start with just hydration, that it just hydrates your body better. And then downstream from that, all these other great things happen. Um, and, and so even that to me is, is a no. I mean, that to me is tantamount to lying. Like, okay, we're not explicitly telling the lie, but we are, uh, aligning ourselves with the lie or with the lies and, 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 and then making money because people are assuming that our electrolyte supplement is, let's say it's, it's going to help them hydrate better. We didn't say that, but we know other people are saying that. And we know that's the only reason why they're looking for an electrolyte supplement. And so, you, you know, something that I don't, I don't know if it's actually a great idea. It would have to be tested in terms of e-commerce, like conversion. But um, I, I've noted this down that it, it would be amusing to me, at least, to have a section of the website of uh, uh, the products uh, that we don't sell. So here's what we do sell. And, and here are things we don't sell. And electrolytes would be in there. <laughs> and it would be similar to it would look maybe like a product page, but then it would just be explaining why. We don't sell an mm -hmm. electrolyte supplement. Probably never will because I think the research is pretty clear at this point. I mean, if, hey, if if that changes, I would be uh, I, I, would, I would be happy because it would be better for Legion if I could make an honest, evidence based case for why an everyday uh, gym goer should 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 drink an electrolyte supplement, and, and it would have to be more than just salt or primarily salt because they can just salt their own water. They don't need to uh, again pay me a 15 times markup for salty water unless unless it's it's salty water but it tastes good unless that's enough hey yeah. if that's enough would then, you have then some fine. good flavor so you know yeah, that I might mean, be enough that, that would be fine at least <laughs> and, and again it comes back to that would be an honest where at least the, the consumer knows yes i could salt my own water but it doesn't taste good and legions uh tastes good and it has a couple other things uh and and there's actually good evidence to support it Okay, great. That sounds like a winning product, mm -hmm. uh, but that's not where it's at. And so that would go on the on the products we don't sell section of the store, along with BCAs and some others. Yeah, because you also run into because you are so science and evidence based that if you sell it, even if you don't make those claims, people will associate Correct. that. Oh, because this brand who is science based is promoting this, then that means 
again, even if you make no claims whatsoever, people draw their own conclusions or just associations of, hey, since Legion sells it, that means that it's a good product or that it's a product worth having. Because I think people do make that association with Legion because you have been very careful about what types of products you are going to put out, what makes sense, and what is going to be useful instead of just putting it out because other people are putting it out or because you know it will sell, um, which again, what a lot of people run into because supplements can have really incredible margins. A lot of suppl supplement companies I know have incredible margins, but then there are companies that-, that is <laughs> inversely related to product quality. Yes, always. very, very There's much a, so. a little insider <laughs> baseball of, unfortunately with sports nutrition, you can choose to have great products or great margins. Mm -hmm. You can't have both. Sadly, and, yes. <laughs> and, and so- Great products, I suppose you could say there's an there is a, a subjective element to that because I mean there are business realities. So uh, to get very specific, so Legion's gross margins now are the best they've ever been, and I want to say it, last month it was forty three percent or so gross margin. So not not net that would be insane, but <laughs> gross margin, right? So so cost of goods uh, it might have been one or two percent. Um, from there, but so, so cost of goods are, you know, 60, 60 X percent of, uh, or sorry, 50 X percent of, uh, it, they've, they've been in the sixties for so long. That's my brain still because <laughs> they, because, because the gross margins were, uh, for a long time, I think it dipped as low as 35%. And that's actually too low. You, you, you get, you run into business problems mm -hmm. when your gross margins are too low. Um, Big and, time. and that was driven by cost of goods. Right. And so, um, for since the beginning, I, I didn't, I didn't have much attention on profitability, uh, which is because at the time I was selling a lot of books and self-published. I was making more money than I really, I mean, I, I didn't have a, I still don't have an extravagant lifestyle, but at the time, I mean, I didn't even have a house. I had a little condo and that was it. I didn't have much expenses. So I didn't, really quote unquote need to be taking money from Legion. So I, I just spent way too much on, on products and certain products that where it gets a, to be unnecessary, where you look at a product and you go, okay, yes, this is an excellent product. This one ingredient is costing $10 a bottle. Does that make sense? Objectively, does it, does it, do we have, you know, the, if we were to not have that ingredient, uh, it's, it's a less great product, but it's still a great product. Like if you just compare this product to, uh, any of its peers, so to speak, I mean, it has, even you take that $10 bottle, uh, ingredient out, it still has 50% more active ingredients than, um, than even the best of, of its competitors. Uh, and the, the, the ingredients are dosed correctly and, 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 and so I've had to become a little bit more, uh, I would say business savvy um, but you know there's that's i think i think we're in a good place now where the profitability is not great but it's good by business standards it's good it's not a um it's not a, like an alarm bell that's that's going off which 30s is is that that's that's problematic as they say um and i think as the business grows because of economies of scale it it can improve but i I doubt that it will ever be able to go beyond uh, the gross margin beyond probably high 40s or, or maybe 50% uh, because there is just this reality that good products cost money. Good ingredients cost money. Good dosing costs money. Uh, even, even something like using natural sweeteners, natural flavoring using natural food dyes like coloring that comes from fruit for example as opposed to chemicals that is is shockingly expensive actually yes. to, to, to put real numbers to it so you take um something like one of our protein powders and i actually don't know the latest number and as we've grown uh, our our cost of goods for the same products have gone down, which has allowed us to improve our gross margins. That's really how we've improved. And then also the um, the the guy that um, runs all of our manufacturing and our, our production is very good at his job, and he gets a lot of credit for for improving the the um, the margins. Uh, however, it was to flavor and to sweeten 
a bottle of our whey protein, it, it was as high as the, I remember the, the most painful number. <laughs> it was as high as about $4 a bottle. Jeez. What was, that's what it cost me just, mm-hmm. just to use natural ingredients. Now, if I would have used artificial ingredients, that would have, at that time, it would have reduced it to, I want to say 50 to 75 cents, something like that. And so that's, that's hugely significant because that is, is money. The, the three ish dollars, um, three plus just goes from the top line to the bottom line. That's, that's how that works. Um, and I mean, at this point, uh, we'll sell probably about, um, we'll do about $50 million in sales this year. So, uh, and a large percentage of that is, is protein powder. And, uh, so even a decision like, like that is something that it's a core part of our value proposition at this point. And a lot of our customers, uh, really appreciate the fact that we use natural sweeteners and we use, we, we don't use Myself, any artificial. most of all. I like literally cannot tell you how much I appreciate it because not that artificial sweeteners are bad, but they absolutely rip apart my yep. stomach and how yep. I feel. And the number of times that I see a supplement, just because I, I like to try different things. I like to be able to talk to clients about different things that I'll see something. I'll be like, oh, maybe I'll try that. I look sucralose, one of the first or second ingredients or just all down the list I see it and I'm just like well I'm not I'm never gonna try that thing I'm never gonna have that and anytime I've talked talked to any supplement owner or someone who's involved in it they're like it just costs too much we'd rather just not do it and it doesn't make that big of a difference for people and I'm like well you lost me as a as a customer. So it makes a big difference for me. So I largely appreciate that. And it's something where I also, I, I personally really like the taste of it. I know sometimes, especially if people are used to having the artificial sweeteners all the time of having something that's naturally sweetened of it being like an adjustment, but I absolutely love how it's flavored. I mean, I have the protein every single day, if not twice a day. So I'm all in on it. <laughs> yeah. I, that's one of our stickiest products. Um, so the actual number is it's somewhere between 40 and 50%. I don't remember the exact, but it's, it's in the forties percent of people who buy our, our way plus our way isolate the first time come back to buy it at least one more time. And so for us, that's a, that's a, that's a very good number. And that's also one of our most highly rated and reviewed products as well. Pulse is, is number two, but especially for just positive reviews and especially positive reviews related to taste. I, I would say that, I mean, I'm biased, but I think most of our of our flavors will stand up to artificially sweetened yes. and flavored All but one flavor. I only have beef with one flavor, but everything else I (laughs) am a very big fan of. Um, And I mean, I shout cinnamon cereal from the mountaintops. Uh, Me and Alex I still still love it. I still still just alternate between that and and the salted caramel. Oh, love the salted caramel. Alex and I always have fights because his favorite is cocoa cereal. And then my favorite Uh, is cinnamon cereal. And we always go back and forth. But that is like regularly ordered and stocked. And anytime somebody is over, we have like a whole wall of the legion protein and they're like oh my gosh that's so much protein i was like do you want some because it's so (laughs) good um because people will be like oh i've wanted to try but they don't sell sample packets i was like well you also understand that is a high cost to do sample packets um but i'm like here i'll make my own sample packets because you need to try this because it is that good um so we sell people that's that's, (laughs) that's my brother-in-law he does that with pulse he'll bring it in baggies (laughs) yes to people to people in the gym because inevitably you you work out with the same people mm-hmm. and uh and then some of them are are friendly and you get to know them a little bit and then you, you just start talking fitness things um but we are we are working on sample packets that was it, it's been it's been more difficult like logistically than i i i thought it it, it sh- would have been or should have been because even like the machines to do the sample packets are insane yeah and and so it's just getting the right manufacturer who can do it and then getting to reasonable minimum order quantities so you're not having to spend huge amounts of money and and basically like having to buy 
a year's worth of sample packets or something that um, will will sit in a warehouse and and also being able to do some varieties of flavors. It sounds really simple and it's not it's it's not difficult, but it has been difficult to find the right manufacturer who is set up to do it the way that we want. But it is it looks like it's actually going to happen because that we've had some false starts where we thought, oh, cool, we can do this. And I, I don't care to even make money on the sample packets. I've said we can just sell them at our cost. The, the point is not to generate profit. Uh, people, the point is to acquire new customers or acquire new customers for for products or even for flavors, if you look at it that way. And um, so we can make it, we can make it affordable. It doesn't have to be very expensive, uh, but we're working on it. Yeah, though that's awesome to hear because anytime anyone comes over to our house for whether they're doing a podcast in person or we have staff over or just our friends over, I'm always like, take some because I know it can be hard to commit to like a whole container of something that you haven't tried before. So I am always trying to like shell it out to people to get them in the door. <laughs> um, <as> my, a whole. <laughs> my, uh, my consolation prize for that was uh, the return policy. Yes. I was going to bring that up. We try to make sure that people understand Mm -hmm. how it works. So, and, and some people are probably skeptical because that's also, I think not very common in, well, just in business in, in general period, but in supplements, it really doesn't make sense to have people send you back opened used supplements. What are you going to do with those supplements? So, um, for people listening, our return policy is very simple. If you don't like something, you just let us know and we give you your money back and that's it. Or if you want to try something else, we'll send you. So take a, you don't like the flavor, but you haven't given up on the product yet and you want to try another flavor. Sure. We'll send you that. Or maybe, you know, you like other products and you'd rather just get a store credit for, you know, the protein powder you didn't like or whatever. And you're just going to flip it over here and, and get some post-workout or pre-workout. Sure. We'll do that, whatever you want. And so Many people appreciate that, but we also we've also we've we've acquired quite a few customers that way because of exactly what you're saying, where people will buy a flavor of uh, let's say our way that they they don't like, but they know people who also work out and who use protein powder, and so they give it to a friend, and they then go to a different flavor. So we've retained that customer and they get a flavor they like. And then the friend actually likes the Mm -hmm. flavor they didn't like. And so now we have a a new customer. So it it works. Yeah. And in case anyone didn't understand, that means you do not have to send the product back at all. You just get your money back. You keep the product. You don't have to go through printing off the label, taking it somewhere because you wouldn't just be able to put a lot of the products just in your mailbox. You don't have to deal with any of that. You just get to have your money back and move on from it. Exactly. Yep. Low reps is best. High reps is best. Fruit is so it's good. It's terrible. For you me. should lift heavy. High reps. Carbs low are needed. Keto squats are bad for your Squats needs. are great. You for should your squat needs. after toes. It's fine. It fits my macros. For idiots. When there are so many mixed messages going around, it's hard to know what you should even do or focus on. But that's exactly where physique development one-on-one coaching comes in. You might have heard of online coaching or even hired a coach before, but we believe in teaching you the why behind what we do while truly taking your life into consideration. We want to train, educate, and empower you to reach your goals and help you to stop spinning your wheels and just finally feel good. And hey, we're here to help you look good too. You need you. Your health is your wealth. So join Physique Development and let us be the last coach you ever need. Um, But going back to the overrated and underrated, we talked about yohimbine yohimbine and electrolytes. Um, So to stay on the same aspect with um, yohimbine and talking about fat burners, Overrated or underrated fat burners with caffeine? I mean, overrated. Anything related to body comp is generally going to be overrated. Maybe the one exception I can think of is uh, creatine. Is 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 probably the way that it's generally promoted. I think it actually it it more or less does deliver on 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 the claims. And so, um, but. With, with fat burners, whether they have caffeine or not, I mean, with caffeine is, is going to be better, generally speaking, um, it, especially if the person doesn't get caffeine from any other source, even if we only go with the boost in metabolic rate that, um, that you will consistently experience with caffeine. And I mean, if, if you, uh, 
have large amounts of it for a long time, that effect is going to become attenuated to, to some degree. Um, but even, even if you are fully habituated to caffeine, research still shows that it will still improve your performance and it still can improve your metabolic rate by uh, maybe somewhere between 50 and 100 calories, depending on, on how much you're having. And so that's useful. Uh, as far as what else is in the fat burner, that is usually where uh, it becomes very overrated because there just aren't that many ingredients that, um, that have been shown to make any real difference. And so I mentioned uh, previously that you can have something like yohimbine or yohimbine. Actually, it's, I've always said yohimbine, but one of those things. I, I've heard I, it I both haven't. ways. So yeah, I, I always I go back and forth. <laughs> I'll just stick with yohimbine. That's the way I've always said it. I may be wrong. Um, and synephrine, for example, uh, where synephrine also actually has a, um, a stimulant effect for, for metabolic rate. So those, those are um, helping your body either burn more calories or you could say maybe burn fat more efficiently. And then you have uh, another mechanism which could be reducing appetite and that doesn't directly burn fat. But uh, if you are generally less hungry, you're going to stick to your diet better. You're probably just going to get better results. Um, that, that's of course why we see drugs like semaglutide working so well for, for many people is it just turns off their appetite. They're just not hungry anymore. And, and so um, fat burners though are generally high margin. So pills are higher margin as a rule. Pills are higher margin than powders in sports nutrition. Typically what, what companies are trying to do is they're trying to use their powder products to get new customers. And that usually means primarily protein, um, usually whey and pre-workout. So those are the two kind of customer acquisition engines for the company. And they have to spend the most money producing those products. And so the margins are generally the worst uh, on those products. You, you probably could include post-workout in there as well. Um, but the two big ones are pre-workout and protein. And then you use pills to drive profit. And so the pill products are usually the ones that are most underdosed or that the ingredients have the least amount of scientific evidence or uh, they have evidence of um th th there's evidence that they that they don't work and so in the case of uh fat burners like Gar garcinia cambogia for example there was evidence early on in rats that showed that it could greatly increase metabolic rate looked very promising uh and then in humans completely flopped and the reason for that is although we share a lot of dna with rats. We are not just big rats. And one of the big differences between us and rats is our metabolisms. Rat metabolisms run way faster than human metabolisms. And there are a lot of then um, specific differences that, uh, that, that create the, the circumstances for something like Garcinia Cam Cambogia to greatly increase fat loss in rats and do nothing in humans. And uh, Garcinia Cambogia, though, was very popular for a long time. Still is very po fairly popular if you just look at it, just look at it on Amazon, look at it in Google Trends. Still, still a lot of people buying it because there was so much marketing uh, around it for so long that it just it became just uh, like established as an effective fat loss supplement, at least in the uh, in the minds of of many consumers. And uh, it, it, there's so much material out there still that, that promote it and it, it just won't go away basically, regardless of the, again, there are studies that, that show it does not work. It's not, it's not a question mark. It's not even, um, well, we see some evidence of efficacy in rats. Maybe it will pan out in humans. I don't think that's a, a good uh, uh, reason to include uh, an ingredient in a, in a supplement. Uh, I think that you should have human evidence and you should have high quality human evidence with maybe the exception of, I can think of something like we had uh, an ingredient called rudocarpine or rudocarpine. I always say in, but, uh, and that was in, we recently reformulated our sleep supplement lunar. It was in a previous version of lunar, uh, but it was with the asterisk of 
this this has shown promise in animal uh, in the animal model for clearing caffeine faster out of the body. And here mechanistically is how that works. And here's why it may also have the same effects in humans, um, no negative effects. And so we've included it just in case. It's, it's kind of a bonus ingredient. It's speculative. We acknowledge that. It, it's not a primary ingredient of this product. But generally speaking, we don't even do that. I just remember that was actually when I was working with Curtis and that was his idea. And I kind of liked it just because if it did work, then the specificity is great because um, fitness people generally have a fair amount of caffeine. And if you are a slow metabolizer of caffeine, so um, if you have slow, slow genes, you can have fast, fast, you can have fast, slow or slow, slow for clearing out um, toxins and poisons and things like caffeine. If you're slow, slow, uh, I mean, it, you, it, if I remember correctly, you have caffeine, the time that it takes to fully clear, just let's say you have a couple shots of espresso, like 200 milligrams of caffeine. It was, it was... Uh, 48 to, to 50 something hours is how long uh, caffeine will remain in your system. It may even been a little bit longer. It's been some time since I, since I read about that. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's the person then who they have pre-workout at 2 PM, which you would think, let's say they go to bed at 11, eh, no problem, 2 PM. Uh, but, but no, by the time they're trying to go to bed, there's still half of the caffeine that they had at 2 PM in their blood. And that of course is, it can disrupt sleep. And so, um, the coming back to, to, to something like Garcinia Cambogia, there was a time when there was promising rat research. Uh, and then there's though, there was a big question mark about how is this going to extrapolate to humans? And, um, there were, there were skeptics because of this point of the difference in the metabolism between the rat and the human. And we've seen this before, raspberry ketones, another example. And, and so unsurprisingly, once those human trials got done, it turned out to, to be a flop. And, and so fat burners in general, unfortunately, it's a lot of that. It's a lot of ingredients that either have basically no evidence of efficacy whatsoever, or have proven to do nothing. Um, or in a best case scenario, maybe there's, there's some speculative evidence that it may or may not work. And so, you know, it's a, it's a difficult, it's a difficult product to, to formulate. And we've gone through several iterations of our kind of all purpose fat burner, which I don't even like, I actually don't even like the label fat burner. Yeah. The only, the only reason that I went with it is that is what people call these products. Uh, and that, that is the entire category. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, I guess there are some alternatives that are much less popular, but it's still more of the same weight yeah. loss supplement. It's very right? difficult when it's like you have the association that people have with something yep. and the way someone can recognize something versus like how you feel or how it even is portrayed of like, it's not yep. necessarily. Like if you call uh, it diet support yeah. or something. And then what people is that? are like, what's diet support? And then it's what like, you have to do mean? all of this marketing and email marketing to then explain what it means when you could just use the common term, even though sometimes that pushes more to people just thinking, okay, all these different types of pills that are going to let me see these results exist. Exactly. And then ironically, so let's say you, you led with diet support, which I'm sure that there's, there's a, a better alternative that could be a uh, device, but let's say that's it. Right. And then you explain what this product is, and then like, oh, so you mean fat burner? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, you're like, okay, well, so <laughs> it, yeah, not not exactly, but I get it. Like, mm -hmm. like, yes, it is a product that is related to losing fat, and it's intended to help you lose fat faster. Yes, uh, and and so uh, again, I was resistant to 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 even using that term, but that was, a, 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 it was a marketing decision, mm -hmm. uh, simply because that is the entire category and that's what people are looking for. And so I figured, okay, um, so that's, that's what we're going to call. That's how we're going to, that's the descriptor of the product. However, when we educate people on how this product works, what's in it and set expectations, then I think that it's, I don't think it's unethical that, that, that was my, 
my take on it, even though I understand it's even controversial fat burners period. I mean, that is a, and, and with, with a uh, good reason, it, it, it is a controversial, um, category of supplement. And it always will be because, uh, again, coming back to the margins point, these are typically very high margin products. Many of them are very expensive and uh, they're not expensive to, to create. The many of these products that are out there that are selling for 50, 60, 70, 80 dollars a bottle. And, uh, and let's say, um, I think of I think of the multivitamin as well, another example of this that uh, if you're good at marketing, a lot of people are willing to pay a fair amount for these products, especially a fat burner because they, they really want to to lose fat. I mean, that's mm -hmm. a that's a strong desire. Speaking for, to a big pain point. Correct, correct. And so so many people are willing to pay a premium for that. And so you could imagine where you spend five, six dollars a bottle, maybe seven dollars a bottle if you're uh, if you're generous, and then you're you're marketing it up, you're marking it up ten to twelve times. Uh, that's I mean, that's huge in term in sports attrition really in any in that's like that's like clothing margin margins um and whereas i mean if you compare so our our whey protein for example um the the price spiked during covid where it the the two pound bottle was costing me to get it to a customer it was costing me 38 dollars to to get a bottle of whey protein to people and at that time, I, I, and this is again, just being bad at business, I had never raised my prices once. This was like seven years into the business. I had, we had not very raised. very similar business models and paths <laughs> that we followed along the way. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, 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 yeah, it, it doesn't, it, it really makes no sense looking back on it because uh, my, my costs in some ways got better, but in some ways got worse because economies of scale, yeah, they exist in sports nutrition, but it's not as significant as I wish it it was, um, and and so if you if you look at when the business was one fifth its current size, yeah, generally um, most ingredients are more expensive. But unfortunately, um, just just with even the normal rate of inflation, the price of everything just just generally goes up, and and then now we have inflation in certain sectors i mean it's absurd i mean just look at what we've seen in the grocery store despite what the government tells us like yes. no no don't believe your lying eyes right <laughs> um and and so the 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 way that's what it was costing me is uh is 38 dollars a bottle remember that number but and and a couple people working uh with me were thinking maybe we should look at using a different material because the material that we're using is it comes from ireland and this is the whey protein that it comes, it mm -hmm. comes from Ireland. And it is, it, I mean, it's still hands down the best whey protein that I've ever had, period. And when I was uh, originally, this is pre-launch of the company, was sourcing uh, protein powders for this, uh, for, for, for whey plus. And so I just want to know what are the, what are generally considered from people who are in the industry on, on the manufacturing side of things? What are the best whey isolates in the world. And so I got, I got one from the US. I got one from, um, I think it was New Zealand. I got one from Ireland and I think Holland was, was the, the, the final one and just taste tested them. And the Irish whey was clearly the winner. It, 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 it tasted better than the others. And it had a, and anybody who's had our protein knows it has a very creamy mouth feel. And it mixes really well, but it has no fat, which is, uh, at first I was, I actually didn't believe it at first. So like, there's no way this is zero grams of fat per serving. It, it tastes, it tastes almost like it's cream or something. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, so I've stuck with that, uh, since the beginning. And when, when the, when the prices just got ridiculous, um, a couple, a couple of the people who work with me we're starting to like the idea of moving to just a domestic, not, not moving away from way isolate, but going to, uh, the, the U S, uh, the best, the best quality way isolate you can get made here in the U S 
And, and I just said, absolutely not. No, <laughs> we're, we're, we can, we, we, I agree that we uh, should raise our prices and we have to at this point with what's going on. Um, I'm fine with that, even though, uh, again, I just, I just never thought of it. It is kind of a normal business practice, but yes. And, and our customers, thankfully, we got basically no pushback whatsoever, which was a really, I was, uh, I mean, I was a little bit concerned, uh, curious how people would respond. And that was nice to see just that it shows the value is there and it shows how much our customers appreciate, uh, our products. Yeah, and so, so, quality. um, yeah, exactly. And, and I mean, it, it, it makes sense. It's logical. And, you know, in retrospect, you go, yeah, of course. But before you make that decision, you go, I mean, I think it's, I think I understand it's a business decision we have to make at this point. Again, coming back to margins and so forth, like if your margins get too low, then um, you, you eventually go out of business. So you mm -hmm. can't, you, you can't you, there are certain things you just have to do. Um, and in, in the case of a couple of products, we had to raise prices five or $10 a bottle. I mean, that's, that, that's a big, that's a big jump. And, uh, the way is an example of that. Um, but, I, changing, changing to another way, I, I think would have been a huge mistake because of just how popular that product is. And although the, the material they were proposing was good, it wasn't bad. It was clearly different and not as good, um. Uh, so, yeah, I remember looking in and when I found out that you guys were sourcing from Ireland, I was super thrilled because that's like where the best comes from. And I was like, well, that's that makes sense why it tastes so good and why yeah. I like it so much. <laughs> I know. I know. And, and the cool thing is you really can taste it. Mm -hmm. You know, it sounds kind of like marketing bullshit. Like, oh, yeah, it comes from these small family owned multi-generational Irish farms. You're like, yeah, OK, cool. That, that sounds nice. Uh, and, and then, and then there's even research and we cite the research that, well, I mean, Ireland is also known for producing really high quality mm -hmm. way, uh, dairy across the board and I mean, that includes bowl. whey. and, and, but still the, 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 the skeptic in even, even, even in me, which, uh, I think is, I mean, just, just to, to comment on marketing, it, it's a good mindset to have when you are thinking about how you're going to market a product or service is you have to you have to be extremely skeptical like whenever you are coming up with maybe a claim or an angle or how you're going to explain something you should be challenging yourself like so what uh you know says who and and that should be your mindset as opposed to being your own ideal kind of maybe even gullible type of person who just takes <laughs> everything at face value right and so the irish claims uh are, are are i'm sure met with a lot of skepticism as they should be because it does kind of sound like just just marketing puffery uh but uh try it out try it out if you, if you don't like it we'll just give you your money back <laughs> we'll give you but your money back. <laughs> uh, i think i think i think you will taste and you'll feel again the creamy. It's that's mm -hmm. part of the experience. I think it's nice to drink. Yeah, it's so funny. Sometimes I wish I could just share margins on certain things. I'll be like, I promise you, like I'm not just making money off of you. Like this is the best quality thing, and I wanted to provide it to you, but I also couldn't lose money on this. So yeah. this is what the margins are. Please see it. I'm not trying to trick you. Um, I've but. I've <laughs> I've thought about that because uh, I've worked on the conversion rate optimization for a couple of years now worked with uh, an agency and just because I, I like I, th I just think it's an interesting type of work I, I like marketing in terms of business I like marketing the most because I find um, I like that it uh, it's a creative activity and so I, I like creative work the most and I like psychology and persuasion just as topics and that's um a way to learn and, and actually use use the that knowledge and so I, i've thought about that and we've tried that angle in a couple of different ways and uh, i think one of them stuck but just that angle of thought about like i wonder if, I wonder if some sort of radical transparency around margins um could could play well and then i remember having these discussions the the counter argument to that is if if somebody isn't uh, business savvy at all, if they don't if they don't own a business and they don't understand that 
uh, just the reality of business economics, then if, if they might hear that Legion's gross margins are finely in the 40s consistently, and they may think that that sounds egregious, or they may m- misinterpret that as the bottom line, like that's what I get to yeah. keep or something. The bottom you know what line. I mean? Yes, that is a yeah. big thing of like <laughs> the difference between like even just gross revenue versus growth, gross po- profit. I'm yeah. like just let because, alone net, let yes. alone net profit. <laughs> well, yeah, that's a whole nother discussion. But it's I I do agree with that. Now that you're saying that, if people don't always understand those terms, so even when I talk with family about different things with business, and I'll say, okay, this happened this month, then they like you see their eyes widen. I'm like. That is the gross revenue. That is not what I take home. That is not what we made. That is not anything to do with that. Um, And that can be hard to conceptualize. But I just love being transparent in those things because I hate the marketing that tricks people. And so I'm like, how can I be the most honest? Um, But then you kind of have to balance that with what do people know and what what can they even compare that to in their own yep. life? Because if they see 40%, they might be like, okay, then that means that they're taking home all of this. And it's yep. like, that that's not how it exactly works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now a 40% bottom line. <laughs> it, yeah. They're selling you uh, maltodextrin. That's it. <laughs> they're, they're, they're selling electrolytes. Yes, <laughs> that, they're that, selling that's electrolytes. What, that's what they're selling. They're selling you salt uh, <laughs> that, that's marked up 20 times. Perfect. Uh, Yeah, I love that within the fat burners, air quotes that Legion has, that there is the option of having one with caffeine or without caffeine, just because I do, and I really enjoy this within the pulse as well, that you now have ones that are caffeine free, because I really enjoy either the benefits of it, but I either have caffeine outside of that, that I really enjoy and want to still have, or I'm wanting to monitor my caffeine amount. And sometimes with those supplements where it only sells it all together, then you can kind of feel a little bit handcuffed of, I have to choose one or the other. And I just like that it gives you the option of here's how you should use it. But if you want to have just the caffeine in the pill, or if you want to have your own caffeine alongside of it, then you can go ahead and do what works best for you. Yep. Yep. Exactly. I use the stim free pulse as well. And I I would use uh, caffeine free Phoenix as well if I were dieting and I wanted to use it um, just because I get my caffeine from espresso. And I, I now have I've limited it to, I mean, it's hard to say exact. It's probably two to 250 milligrams a day, which is fairly low given my body weight. Um, and previously I was having double that. And that was kind of my standard intake, four to 500 milligrams a day, basically forever. And uh, I went from that down to 200-ish. And then I went from 200 to zero-ish for a bit just to see what that would feel like. And I uh, didn't feel great, but <laughs> I, I made it. Uh, and and I did notice coming down from that four to 500 uh, that if I, so, so a couple things. One, if I didn't have my little espresso drink around the same time in the morning, like if I missed it, quote unquote, or didn't have caffeine by a couple of hours, uh, I, I might get a headache. It wasn't, it wasn't guaranteed, but uh, sometimes I did start to get a little bit of a headache just by not having the caffeine at the time I normally would. And, um, and then if I didn't have any caffeine at all, uh, in the day, then there was an even greater chance that I was going to get a headache. And when I reduced my, my caffeine intake, I also felt, I just felt a little bit off even going from four to 500 to certainly when I, uh, I cut it in half and then I went to zero and I didn't, I didn't stay at half for that long. I think just a few days I figured instead of going from four or 500 to, to zero and making it as annoying a, as possible, I'll just, I'll cut it halfway. And so, um, for those reasons, I figured, even though I know that the weight of the evidence shows that around 400 milligrams per day is, is the upper, uh, this kind of the upper ceiling, a recommended ceiling for most people. So it's not that having four or 500 milligrams per day, is necessarily a, a cause for concern. I also know that I'm a fast metabolizer. So I mentioned the, the two genes that we have related to metabolizing things like caffeine. So I know from a, from a genetic test that I'm a fast, fast, uh, metabolizer, which, uh, also, I mean, I kind of already knew that because it takes a lot of caffeine for me to really feel it. And I come down off of caffeine fairly quickly. I don't crash, but within a few hours, I generally don't feel it anymore and blah, blah, blah. And so, um, 
I, I like that at my current level of intake, two to 300 milligrams, then if I miss it in terms of timing, no effects. If I don't have any at all, uh, no effects. And so that's why I stick with stim free stuff uh, generally. I was in a really bad, especially in 2020, it just like was so much going on with business that uh, Alex and I were regularly having like 800 milligrams to a gram a day. And that was like the norm. And I have always been someone who I do metabolize fast. And so it wasn't having an effect on me in regards of like, oh, it, I'm struggling with my sleep, where a lot of times that's where people then start to cut back on caffeine if they're jittery or it's affecting their sleep. But I was feeling like the overall impact to my body and what it was doing and um, then have stayed around 200 milligrams for a good chunk of time and just realized like I not the aspect of like, oh, I don't need it, but it's the amount that I would need to see the impact that I might want to see is more than I know that my body is going to be the most yep. responsive to. And so, so you, <laughs> you just have to, you just have to, one of those things you're like, well, I wish reality were otherwise, yes. but, <laughs> but I this guess is my I'm going to accept reality. it as it is, not yeah. as I wish it were. Exactly. And I've actually, I used to be, I'm a huge fan of coffee and just black coffee. I will, you know, have a fun drink every once in a while, but but I always, because I was a coffee drinker, then I always heard people say like decaf was horrible or like p big coffee drinkers really hate on decaf. And so I just like hated on decaf because that's what I thought you should do. But I have gotten into decaf espresso and just being able to have that allows me to have like the fix of I love the taste of coffee um, without just overdoing it because I can very easily drink like four or five cups of coffee in a day from taste. And so I've like scaled back of like, okay, I'll have my decaf. I'll still have some caffeinated, um, but being able to have that in place. So it just allows me to kind of balance that um, within my caffeine. That's what I do. So I do, um, so I basically, I guess you could say, I, I don't even, it's, it's not a cappuccino. There's probably uh, a flat white or I don't know what they call it. But so um, a cappuccino, I guess that the true Italian cappuccino, it's, it's a small cup. It's like an eight ounce cup. And so if you have a double shot in that, that is, that's a good ratio for me in terms of espresso to milk. So where it doesn't taste like coffee flavored milk, I don't like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I do like uh, milky espresso, if mm -hmm. that makes sense, right? And so so what I do though is, um, so I do two, I guess it's hard to say exactly because it's kind of a bigger um, port of filter. It's, it's, it's something in between two and three shots. So uh, about 21 to 22 grams of grounds are going into, into it. Right. And, um, so let's just call it two, two and a half shots of decaf, uh, as well as two to two and a half shots of caffeinated. And, uh, and then I'm, I'm frothing like six ounces of milk. And so, um, in terms of grams of liquid, it's maybe about 70 grams of liquid for the espresso and then six ounces of milk, whatever that translates is it's maybe comparable. And so that's what I like to drink. I like it to be strong. Um, and I, for, for a while was just doing the four to five shots of, of just regular espresso, which is probably around 80 milligrams. I mean, it depends on various factors per shot. Um, and so that was my compromise, but I found a, a decaf. I mean, I, I found a, I like their caffeinated as well. I've tried many different roasters from, uh, I tried from, let's see, Tra Drink Trade was a website that I used for a while. There, weren't, there are a couple of these websites out there that make it really easy for you to um, try out roasters around the country. And, you know, whenever they roast a, you get freshly roasted coffee and you, typically you want to wait for espresso about a week anyway um, is, is when it will taste best, probably from like weeks two to four or so it's going to taste the best and if it's um uh, inside of that or outside of that it just tastes different and if it gets too far outside it tastes it can taste bad um and so i've tried many roasters there's a roaster based out of seattle called espresso vivace v-i-v-a-c-e and they 
are so good. I I just stopped trying uh, other roasters, and That's when you they're know. <laughs> yeah. And and then I'll, I'll go back sometimes because it's kind of fun. There, there's a fun element to mm-hmm. getting you know the the bag because you have these you have a few different websites out there. I, I have them bookmarked. I don't remember off the top of my head where they they're they're very into coffee and they rate all these different beans and they give them kind of like with wine where they're giving them a score ranging from zero to 100, right? But it's, it's, they're into it. They're, mm-hmm. they're, they're professional coffee reviewers, you know what I mean? And so you can, um, you can, you can buy from a lot of these, these roasters either directly from their website or through one of these aggregator websites. And so I occasionally I'll, I'll try something out just, uh, in hopes of maybe finding, something that can beat this this company based out of Seattle, but have have been unable to beat them. So well, I'll definitely have to give that a try then for sure. Yeah. Check out their decaf. It's quite good. Um now the the caffeinated is better. And I, I don't think you're you can get around that really. But for decaf, I think it's I think it's it's quite good. And then um they have a number of different options for their caffeinated. And my favorite is I think they call it is it I'm going to pull it up. Well, if you want to ask me, I'm going to pull up just so I have the exact, uh, no, I'm interested here. for sure. Uh, well, it's funny because talking about, um, we're going to talk a little bit, the next one or the last one I should say is about L-theanine paired with caffeine, which is in Pulse. And we did a taste testing video for all of the Legion protein powders. So we did a blind taste test and we had to guess what the flavor was and then give it a rating. And so um, we went through and did that all. And so we want to do it with the pre-workouts as well because you guys have added so many more flavors. And Miles was talking and he was like, are you going to compare if you can taste the difference between the caffeinated versus the non-caffeinated? I was like, I didn't even think about doing that. He's <laughs> like, you, if you taste them side by side, you could taste like a slight difference. Yeah. I was like, well, because we'll caffeine to- <laughs> tastes extremely bad. As yes. a, as a, as a, it's 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 shockingly bad. Actually, I, I've I've oh, tried yeah, a little I've bit. I've been in the lab. Yeah, it's uh, caffeine disgusting. like um like pills, but the ones that like aren't coated, if you yeah. ever have one of those and then you get the taste on your tongue, it is game over. <laughs> yeah, it is so bad. Are you sick and tired of your glutes not growing, turning around in the mirror and seeing a board for a booty? I've been coaching for nearly a decade, helping thousands of women reach their goals. The most common goal, grow my glutes. Women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s, able to grow their glutes with the guidance of my training programs. And for all this time, I've kept my best glute growth secrets only for my one-on-one clients. And that changes today. We just released our 12-week glute growth program in the PD training app. It is a four-day program with exercise and volume adjustments every three weeks. You can easily access the program through our app and track every single workout. Each exercise will have a detailed video teaching you exactly how to perform each and every movement. And guess what? I am no longer gatekeeping. I'm sharing every single one of my best glute growth secrets inside this program because you are awesome and I want you to have this program. I'm going to give you $25 off, making it a fraction of what you spent at Starbucks this past month. Use code POD. The link to purchase will be in the description. Now let's get back to the show. What is the the coffee recommendation then here? So so it's their Dolce blend is is my favorite. Okay, so they have they have six or seven to choose from. So all that's right, my well I'm gonna put in an order after this. Yeah, so, yeah let me know what you think. <laughs> I will. Well, so last overrated, underrated here: L-theanine paired with caffeine. Uh, I so there was a time when I would say underrated, uh, especially years ago. I mean, especially going back to the beginning of Legion, uh, wh- where I actually don't know if there was another pre-workout that had L-theanine with caffeine. There might have been, but... I will say I looked into it, and at the time, I couldn't find one. So I would be pretty safe with saying that claim. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there certainly was... There There was no popular product that had theanine. Sure, uh, plenty of products had caffeine, but not theanine as well. And, and and now it's uh, it's in a lot of pre workouts. Um, it's in a lot of just caffeinated products of different kinds. Uh, now you can even just buy caffeine pills that have theanine, so it's much more common now. Um, and and so I, I still though I I don't think that it actually may still be underrated in that if you haven't had caffeine with theanine, you might be surprised at how much it impacts mood in particular. Mm-hmm. So. 
Um, for, for me personally, I remember, so this is when all the way back in the beginning with Legion. And so I had my formulation, my first pulse formulation. I remember it was going to, the cost was $75 a bottle uh, to me. <laughs> <laughs> so you and so, Alex would do really well putting supplements together. That's been his biggest thing is he's like, I could never, people ask like, oh, would you ever start your own supplement company? And he was like, here's the thing. I would choose the best ingredients at all of the best doses, and I do not care how it tastes. So it'd be very expensive and not taste good. But if it's the best, then that's what I want. <laughs> so he has put together uh, That's good for 75. scratching your own itch. Yes. I don't know if many other people have but that's that why he's itch. like that's, that's the... not going to be very marketable but he yeah. has made pre-workouts before that are like 70 or 80 dollars per um per container that he is making just at yeah. cost <laughs> yeah exactly yeah exactly so so uh yeah that that didn't work so um had to had to work down from there which is generally how we've gone about it is we kind of create what's our what's our dream product and we know it's probably going to be too expensive but what's the dream product with everything that we could possibly want in it. Um, and, and then we, we, we always have to work down from there and it's usually removing ingredients. Uh, sometimes there are ingredients that can make the cut because we can go with the lower end of a clinically effective dose. And we can support that with, with research showing that, well, sure. Let's say you have a study that, that used five grams of this, but you have several other studies that that showed good results with two grams or three grams, and so you have a range of clinically effective. And if it's um, if it's feasible to go with the lower end of the range, we may want to do that simply to free up budget, uh, especially if you get diminishing returns. Uh, beta alanine is actually a good example of this, where as time has gone on, research has shown that somewhere in around three and a half grams is is enough to to get more or less all of the performance related benefits and possibly some body comp like muscle related benefits. Uh, whereas previously it was not so clear and the range uh, clinically effective was maybe starting around three up to around five, maybe two and a half to five. And so previously we, we had five grams per serving because we just wanted to play it safe, quote unquote, and go with uh, what was shown to work like that specific dose and taken regularly was shown to work in a number of studies, even though there was some other research that suggested that you might get more or less the same benefits from less. All right, fine. We're just going to go with the larger dose. But then as more research was done, uh, the theory that less would provide more or less the same panned out. And so we then were able to reduce that to what would have been previously like kind of in the middle of the clinically effective range. And that then uh, freed up some money that allowed us to add another ingredient. And then it also reduced the amount of tingles that I like, but I'm kind of weird. Like I take, I take niacin every day because I like the flush. <laughs> I mean, also it's, it's good for your cholesterol profile, um, may have some benefits uh, related to NAD uh, NAD plus, uh, technically levels, uh, more so maybe even than NMN, which is also, I think a completely overrated supplement that I don't sell and don't think <laughs> I'll sell unless a lot more research is done. And it can convince me that it's better than just taking niacin, which is super cheap. Um, but, uh, I, I, I personally like the niacin flush. And so I also like the tingles, the beta alanine tingles, but many people don't, I, I think that's, I think that's one of those overrated, underrated things. Like some people, oh, it's underrated. I love it. And then other people, it's completely overrated. I hate it, right? <laughs> and so by reducing beta alanine, that also has reduced the, the tingles. They're, they're not gone. So uh, the people who like the tingles still get some tingles, but they're, they are less noticeable. So the people who don't like the tingles appreciated that. Um, but, but anyway, that's, that's generally how we've gone about our, our supplements is start with the dream product and then usually have to remove some ingredients that are just way too expensive. There's absolutely no way to make them work. And then there are other ingredients where we can uh, make them work because the clinically effective range is wide enough to allow us to get to a number that we can, we can stand behind, uh, but that doesn't eat up so much of the budget that um, it, it would create actually an inferior product because you only can put so much in it. And if you, you know, use up 30% of your budget on one ingredient, uh, you know, a proper dose of one ingredient that 
is is more of a nice to have rather than one of the foundational uh, ingredients that that doesn't really make sense. But but anyway, so caffeine theanine. Anybody listening, if you haven't tried it before, uh, give it a go. I, I remember when we were. Um, this was before, so this is how that, that whole tangent began. Um, when I got to the first, which ironically, I think in the beginning, if I remember correctly, the pulse formulation that I went with, um, which is similar to the formulation today, we've added a couple things, uh, but the primary ingredients, citrulline, beta alanine, the betaine may have been in there in the beginning. It may have been added. I actually don't remember on that. The caffeine, the theanine, those were all there in the beginning. That was twenty to twenty-five dollars a bottle, my cost, which not not good margins. Uh, in in that, that's uh, that's uh, that you can charge maybe. I think we only charged forty dollars for it, and so that's another example in business where I've I've said that to people just in, in conversation who who haven't had a business or haven't been um, in the in the the economics of, uh, of a business, uh, that sells, that has a real cost of goods and that margin, even if it's a hundred percent markup that, that sounds, that may sound great. Um, but it's not necessarily great because, uh, it, it depends on the rest of the costs in the business. And there are other costs of goods as well. When you, when you factor in, it's not just the cost of producing the product. Um, it's also the cost of getting the product to the person. So uh, there are shipping uh, fees. So we've always had free shipping, not always actually in the beginning, we did not, but we've had sh free shipping on all orders for many, many years. And, and so uh, that quickly can become, you know, a, 40 or let's say even in the 30% gross margin proposition, um, even with that kind of markup, certainly under a hundred percent, uh, markup, if you only can mark up your product 50 or 60 or 70%, um, you're probably going to have issues generating any sort of net profit, uh, at the end of the day. And, and so anyway, though, that's what I went with. Um, and, and so I remember when I was trialing it for the first time, that was the first time I had caffeine and theanine. And I was, uh, I was amazed actually at the mood element of it. Like I, I knew the research and I read it and that's why we were, that's why we put it in there. And there's also some cool stuff related to blood flow and preventing uh, a crash for a caffeine crash. But, um, I felt, I mean, it, it almost, it almost felt euphoric a little bit. I, I would joke that I almost would feel like I'm on drugs, even though I've never used, I've never even been drunk. I've never used this, <laughs> but I imagine, I imagine this is, this is, this is better than just caffeine. This is something between caffeine and a street drug of some kind, uh, because, uh, I, I feel very good right now. And, um, and so that uh, I think is probably the most common feedback that we get from people who have never had caffeine with theanine. And so, so yeah, any, anybody listening, um, give it a, give, give it a try, but, but we're going to have to lower the expectations because if, if you've <laughs> you used recreational it drugs, to a street drug, so let, let's bring so the expectations it's not back it's down. Not, it's not meth. <laughs> so let's, let's make sure, but uh, this is, this is me, uh, being completely naive, uh, <laughs> and, and, and also, and also, and also facetious, obviously, but, but no, I, I think that, um, um, most people are going to respond, they're going to notice the improvement in mood. And if they do tend to feel a little bit off after they have caffeine, they're probably going to notice that that is better. Maybe it's not completely eliminated, but they're probably going to notice that it's better. And they may uh, notice some blood flow related effects like in the gym. Yeah, I'm I'm a huge, huge fan of it. But that wraps up our overrated or underrated. Um, but we will just go through a few quick rapid fire um, just to get to know you a little bit more. So we already learned that you loved the salted caramel um, and the uh, cinnamon cereal for the whey flavors. But what is your favorite flavors for pre-workout slash creatine? I, I always come back to the sour candy for, mm -hmm. for Pulse because I just, I, I don't know, I just like sour candy. Yeah, I like sour candy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so that, but I've had, 
um, some Carson who, who works with us, who runs our customer experience. I now will tell them to just send me random flavors, like send me something that's new so I can just try new things or come back to things that I haven't had in a while. And so currently um, I have, I have fruit punch, um, just, just kind of basic recharge, but I think it's good. Uh, I think there are, there are better, uh, but for a fruit punch, for something that is, is, it's just, uh, it's inoffensive. It's not, it's, it's not, it's not going to maybe impress, but it's, it's probably not going to, um, uh, turn, turn you off. I think, it, I think that's fine. I've always liked our blue raspberries, uh, in pulse and in recharge, the strawberry kiwi also, mm-hmm. I think is quite I good. That was strawberry kiwi. Yeah. That was the last, uh, recharge that I had. And on, on, Pulse. I feel like there was one other recently. I really like the frosted cranberry, oh, but yeah, I that want was... that in stem free because that's one of the mm. only flavors. That's one of my favorite flavors that's not in stem free because sour candy is like my go-to. Yep. Um, and then I've recently gotten into Arctic Blast a little bit, but I love oh, the right. strawberry yeah, kiwi. The yep. um, and then for recharge, I've always been like the biggest fan of the strawberry lemonade. I think that's like bar none, the best flavor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I I like the Arctic Blast. And I like the strawberry lemonade because it sounds like we like uh, sour stuff. Yeah, big fan. Uh, what books are you reading right now? Uh, so right now I'm reading a couple books. I'm reading uh, a book on. So I have an, a kind of a, an an abiding interest in writing fiction, and it's something that was actually my original uh, interest in in writing was was fiction and. I go back all the way to the beginning, um, I, I almost didn't just pivot completely into fitness. Uh, there was a time in the beginning, so I had published Bigger, Leaner, Stronger. This was um, 2013. And, and that book um, did quite well, fairly, fairly, within six months or so, it was selling a lot of copies. In the beginning, I think it sold 20 copies in the first month, which I was excited about. Um, cause I, 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 I figured it's maybe a coin flip between selling zero copies uh, and not zero. That, mm-hmm. that was basically the, that was my expectation in the beginning. Um, and, and, and so I figured that because it, again, what I really enjoyed and I still enjoy is writing. And so I figured that, um, if, if, if the fitness writing does well, I can do more of that. And, um, but I also, uh, want to write other things and, and other, other, uh, nonfiction genres. So, I mean, I wrote a book on the bill of rights, which I actually, I've, uh, I'm wrapping up a pretty extensive update to it because it's, it's sold quite well. It's sold, I think it's over a hundred thousand copies That's now. So and cool. <laughs> it, it's called the know your bill of rights book and, uh, wrote it under a, a pseudonym, Sean Patrick for, for marketing reasons, just because, um, and this is again going all the way back to the beginning and thinking about okay if i'm going to write and i'm interested in writing fitness um i'm interested in other things that i'm interested in i'm interested in writing fiction as well it doesn't really make sense to do that all under my name because it'll be confusing if if people were looking at okay who's this mike matthews guy okay so there's fitness and there's bill of rights and there's like some self-development and there's various genres of fiction that would be just confusing um, and so from a marketing perspective, I figured I, I need to kind of silo, uh, specifically the fitness in particular. And if I, if I write in other genres, you can straddle nonfiction and fiction to some degree, like Steven Pressfield has done that. It can be done, but it doesn't, I don't know if that's even the best way to do it actually, because, um, in marketing first impressions matter so much mm-hmm. and and so depending on the genre that you're writing in whether it's nonfiction or fiction there are expectations there are conventions there are norms and if you don't meet that you can make the wrong first impression and that can be all it takes for somebody to just click on to the next book like for example jk rowling um when she started writing i haven't read uh, i've read some of the harry potter books but i have not read her, I think they're like Mr. Murder Mystery or, or suspense thriller type books. She uh, started to write, and now this is generally known. I think when she started, though, it was not under the name Robert Galbraith. 
Um, and I'm guessing the reason for that is, I mean, maybe she wanted to just see if she could succeed without using her star power uh, in, a, in another genre. But it's also, it, and it's probably more likely that it's just a marketing where, like, if you're going to write books that think of thrillers, I mean, it's dominated by male authors, then you might as well just, uh, you're, you're, in marketing, it, it's it's basically impossible to, to um, work against a trend. If, if you're going to try to succeed, you have to find some sort of existing demand. Uh, and ideally it's a, it's a big demand that you can align yourself with. It's basically impossible to try to buck trends and it's basically impossible to even try to create trends because it just takes too much money, really. Yeah. Even if it just takes too much uh, messaging and it takes it takes too much work to to really create the demand it, it 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 happens more organically and then you just align yourself and so in my writing that was kind of my thinking and so um and uh so in the beginning that that's how I was going about it but then the fitness um this was bigger leaner stronger and I may have gotten out the cookbook the shred chef next or thin leaner stronger next I don't remember exactly uh, and those were doing so well. And I had started this website, Muscle for Life, uh, which is muscleforlife.com, basically a long form blog where I was writing two or three long form articles per week that I decided to just go all in on, on fitness and I'll come back to my other writing interests later, basically. And so now I'm coming back to, to them more as a hobby. So I like, I, you know, I mentioned I, I updated this um, Bill of Rights book, which was fun to do. So and for anybody who wants to check it out, it's called the Know Your Bill of Rights book. I don't know if I said that. And and so that, and then I'm also interested though, again, in writing fiction. So I treat it as a hobby. It's not my most important work. It's, it's I don't have any hobbies. Like I don't play golf. I do this instead. Mm -hmm. So when I have time that I can uh, guilt-free just give to something because there's nothing else urgent or important that I need to do. Then, then I do that. So I'm reading a book right now. I think it's called Mastering Plot Twists, which is okay. I've read now, though, probably about 30 books on fiction and storytelling. And I've done quite a bit of work, not just reading them, but going through and extracting all of the highlights, so all the key material, all of my notes, and kind of building it into a system. Um, I'm basically, it's kind of a series of checklists, essentially, it was the model that I thought made the most sense. Uh, because when you get into studying storytelling, there's a there's a lot to it. There's an art and there's a science, and there there's a lot to telling good stories. Um, a, a lot of, I guess you could say, best practices or th principles that you need to understand that, um, that produce good stories. It, it's not simply a matter of having consumed a lot of good stories, which is good. That's maybe a start, um, maybe in a specific genre. And, uh, and then also even, even being a good, uh, above average or better writer, and then just sitting down and writing stories. You can try that, uh, but if you want to reach a professional level, like if you want to be able to, let's say, sell enough books that you could support yourself. That's what I would say, be a professional writer where you make enough money from that to, to live at least decently well, which is not, wouldn't be my intention per se. I would want to succeed at it, but not necessarily for the, for the, the money that I could make with fiction. I don't really care about that. Um, there's that approach of, well, I'll just kind of muddle my, my way through it. And I'm just going to tell the stories I want to tell. And it, it just, it almost will certainly will not work. Mm -hmm. Can you find exceptions? Yeah, but that's like survivorship bias. All the, most of the planes got shot down and a few of them made it back. And so you probably don't want to go with that strategy. You probably want to figure out how can you kind of engineer the opposite odds. And so that requires study. And so, um, so I, I've read, I've read a fair amount now and kind of going through that whole process. So this book that I'm reading is okay. Not great. I, I can't say I would even recommend it. I had a couple, a couple of new angles on things. I'm like, okay, that's kind of interesting. Like I'm going to take that and plug it into my system. But most of it I've read about in other books that I think do a better job explaining. 
And then I'm also reading, uh, um, I guess I'm rereading because I read it as a, as a kid. I'm reading uh, The Fellowship of the Ring. So I'm, I'm rereading Tolkien's works. So I read The Hobbit and now I'm rereading Lord of the Rings um, because I, I have an interest. I like the fantasy genre and may want to do something. And how I'm thinking about it is I'll start with short stories because if you can't make a short story work, you can't make a novel work. So uh, like just why make it harder than it has to be, right? And so um, I've been reading also a bit more fiction, at least in the last six to 12 months, in anticipation of actually writing it. Whereas for basically eight or nine years, I read very little fiction. I reread some of the dystopian stuff, um, 1984, Brave New World, Animal Farm. And did I do Handmaid's Tale? I don't remember. But um, Animal Farm's a good one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, I, I recommend all three of those. Um, I, 1984 and Brave New World, I don't think they're very good books. Like the stories are not going to, you're not going to find the stories compelling or the characters compelling. Um, but I, I do think the messages in those books are important, um, especially given the, the context of where we're at today. Um, particularly Brave New World, I think that's actually more relevant to where we are than 1984. Um, and so, so anyway, that's, that's what I'm, uh, a very, very long answer to what I'm <laughs> reading right now. Oh, it's good to know. I'll be interested to see the short stories when they come out because you are a very good writer from your blogs and your fitness books. I have not read the Bill of Rights book, but I have read uh, some of your <laughs> other books. So I will be excited um, to see that moving forward. Uh, so what is your favorite meal right now? Um, it's just, I'm um, I'm the wrong guy to ask that because I've been eating the same, more or less the same meals for just years and years. Because I've had the same exact breakfast and lunch for three years. So yeah, I have, had, I'm on the same path. I've had the same dinner for, um, it's probably, well, okay. So it's the same template. I call it the vegetable slop, uh, which is it's it's a variety of vegetables and it's some sort of meat. Uh, it could be chicken or maybe it's a, a, like a lean ground beef and a grain that is almost always white rice. Um, sometimes I'll do brown rice just for the variety, not that it's technically better. Uh, it's not, but um, it's marginally more nutritious. But it doesn't matter. Just eat, eat whichever one you like, and that's good. You're getting in. You're getting in um, some some grains. And I've done quinoa, but prefer rice over quinoa. And so um, it's probably been six or seven years, which is ridiculous to say uh, that that's consistently been my weeknight dinner. That's just my go-to dinner. Mm -hmm. Unless I have some reason I'm going to be eating something else, like that's my go-to. And um, I've changed the flavor profile of it. So for probably half of those years, now, probably like five of those years, it was uh, kind of an Asian. So I would, I would sometimes it'd be like fish sauce and teriyaki sauce and was, um, is hoisin a different there? I had a number of these Asian kind of, uh, sauces and, and, and then the, the, the spices that would go with them. And so I play around with that. And then, um, a couple of years ago I switched to, it's the Thanksgiving slop now. So, uh, I changed the, the ingredients were mostly the same. So previously, um, I mean, it was broccoli, it was onion, it was garlic, it was, um, I think, I, I think mushrooms would go in there. Um, I'm not, I can tell you now what it is, but <laughs> it was, that was the base, I guess. And then some sort of meat, there were usually a few other things thrown in there that I'm just not thinking of, but now, um, so it's onion, it's garlic, it's, oh, there was carrot in it previously and there's still carrot. And there's celery, and there is some riced cauliflower. There is broccoli. Um, there is mushroom, and yeah, I think that's it on the on the vegetables. Again, some sort of meat. Usually, let's just say five ish ounces or so, six inch ish ounces raw, and then um, and then parsley, oregano, rosemary sesame seeds and salt and pepper. So it tastes kind of like Thanksgiving, uh, as a, as a slop. And so that, I mean, I, I, I think I, again, I'm just kind of strange with food in that I, I genuinely enjoy eating it every single day, even though I've been eating it 
regularly for years. No, that's the same way I am. And it just helps with like decision fatigue. It's like I already make enough decisions. I just know this is what I'm going to eat and I'm good to go with it. I don't need exactly. like a ton of variance. I still like some variance, but I do have at least two meals that are exactly the same each day. So then I'm like, all right, I can have some variance outside of that. Yep. Yeah. For me, I mean, even so my, like when we get off here, my usually three to 4 PM meal is a salad. And, and so I'll eat the same salad for a while. And then once there is a, a point, it takes a while, but there is a point where I just don't enjoy it anymore. It, it's just the switch. It's a just, switch. It, it literally yeah, is exactly. one day and you're it like, is. I cannot eat this again. Yeah. <laughs> the day really before weird. you could be like, I was so looking forward to this. And then the next yeah, day you're the day like, I will never eat like this again. Four years of it and, and, you're, and you loved it yesterday yeah. and today you're forcing it down yeah. and that's the end of it, right? So that's what I do. I just I just completely run it into the ground until mm -hmm. I reach that point. And it really is, like you said, it's odd that it's a, it is a switch. It's just on off. It's fully on, fully enjoying, and then it's off. Like this is gross. I have to force myself <laughs> to finish it. And so for salad, um, it's always the same base of spinach, uh, a, a spring mix, some arugula, cucumber, but then um, I can change up the protein so you can cook chicken in many different ways or I could switch to beef um, or just change up the dressing. That's often what I'll do or change up, you know, so currently my salad is that is the base plus some goat cheese crumbles um, plus a, I guess it's kind of like, um, so it's oil and it's yellow mustard and it's a, a light vinegar. I, I'm guessing it's a champagne vinegar. A little bit of honey, a little bit of milk. It could be cream, but the cream, I, I use so little of it, it ends up rotting. So I'm like, whatever, I'll just <laughs> use a little bit of milk. And then some pepper and um, and 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 a like an herb, uh, what, what is this kind of seed? It's a, it has a little sesame seeds and herbs in it basically. And so that's the dressing. Mm -hmm. And so for the salad meal, it's the same kind of concept where, I mean, I enjoy it every single day and I know one day, uh, I'm not going to enjoy it. And then I just go find some other, what's another dressing that I like? Okay, good. And then what are, well, let's change out the goat cheese. Let's put something else in it just to, to change it up. And I can leave the base, which is really what I want from a nutrition standpoint. I want to get in the one to two servings of um, spinach in particular per day. And I just want to make sure I get plenty of greens and the same concept really, um, with the, with the vegetable slop is I want to make sure that I'm getting in at least four to six servings of vegetables every day. And I do think it's smart if you want to optimize nutrition, if you care, not that you have to, but if you, if you want to, then to eat a variety of vegetables. And so I've kind of chosen a number of those vegetables, uh, for their specific properties. Um, and, and again, for people listening, not that you have to, I mean, this might sound completely neurotic to, to, to some people, uh, and you don't have to, if you just, if you just, again, consistently eat, you really probably should be going for that four to six servings per day. A serving be about the size of your fist, a couple servings of fruit, maybe a serving of whole grains, uh, and then some, some healthy fat. Um, and, and of course some protein y you can, you don't have to try to over optimize down to the individual uh chemicals that are in the garlic that you want the allison for <laughs> specific reasons like you don't have to go that far you can just generally eat your vegetables and just go by whatever you feel um but i, I just I, I find that again i enjoy my meals and i can over optimize my nutrition sure great <laughs> and for variety it's usually something on the weekend going out with my family mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I, 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 I'm not a huge foodie, so I'm, I'm generally not going to eat a ton of calories, but I'll just go enjoy something, whatever, yeah. wherever we're going. Something that sounds. you don't have to make, something that's different, just have that variety there. Exactly. Yeah. And that, that works for me. Mm -hmm. Well, good deal. The last question I have is just, uh, what was a question that I didn't ask that you wanted me to ask if there is one. Um, that's, uh, I don't know. I think we've, we've gone all over the place. I, <laughs> I think about the, the, the list we've covered all the things yeah. that even that I was replying with that I thought might be, might be good to talk about. So, um, unfortunately, I don't have a, a quick witty answer for that one. <laughs> that is A-OK. -okay. Uh, I will have all of your stuff linked in the show notes, um, being able to buy all of his books, see the Legion website, uh, get to your podcast. Is there anything else that you want to plug? 
I mean, I have a new book coming out that I'm, uh, I'm tentatively excited about more because it, so it's called stronger than yesterday and it's a, it's a daily reader format. Uh, so short chapters with the, with the idea that you could just read one chapter per day. And it's a variety of educational and what I hope to be inspirational kind of motivational material. Um, I split it basically 50, 50, and then the educational material rotates between diet, exercise, supplementation, general health. So, uh, and then I also put some thought into, um, intermediate or sorry, beginner, intermediate and advanced level information. So I try to try to put something for everyone, uh, uh in there. Uh, on the educational side and then on the motivational side, I, I, for a couple of years now, really, uh, I've been working on this book and been using social media to kind of pretest various ideas and even, even various phrasings of things. And, um, so I'm curious to see how that whole workflow will translate into, um, success with, mm -hmm. uh, with, with a book and so I'm self-publishing this one just because I want to, I want to get it out. Uh, I've had good experiences working with traditional, uh, publishing with Simon Schuster in particular. Uh, however, it takes at least a year from the time that you turn in a manuscript to get it published. And I would like to get this one out, um, quickly. And, and then if it does well, uh, then I, I probably would, would want to do another one just because I, I personally like that format. I like writing long form books, but I also like the essay format. I think it's fun to be able to just jump all over the place as long as, as long as your essays are connected in theme or, um, in, in structure in some way, in, in overall structure that you can, you can, be talk, you can talk about, you know, all kinds of different things. Um, and, and you also, you can be, uh, very, I think efficient, y you can minimize the amount of filler, which I generally try to do, but with other longer form types of writing, there's, there's some quote unquote, what you could call filler, but some people expect, they expect some anecdotes. They expect maybe some history. They expect more in-depth ex explanations of science, um, that, that, that many people find interesting. Other people who just want to get to like, just tell me what to do would consider that filler. Whereas with short essays, if you're only, let's say it's a, it's 500 words, you actually don't have, you have to get to the point mm -hmm. and, and, and people want you to just get to the point that, that you can skip the anecdote, you can skip some of the marketing and you can just kind of get to what you want to say. Um, and so that's going to be coming out. Most of the, the work is done. Um, I, I, yeah, I guess we're just down to, I have all the files ready for the, for the printer. Um, so in the next couple of months, sometime in the summer, it should be out. And, uh, so if anybody is still listening, if you want to check it out, I'd, I'd love to hear your feedback because again, I'm very curious how people are going to respond to it. If people respond well, it'd be fun to do another one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, a few months down the road, I'll make sure I add it to the show notes. So anyone who's listening to it in the future, they'll be able to just go ahead and snag it. Uh, thank but you. thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you for your time. I thought that this was a very insightful conversation and great for the consumer to hear, um, just the average consumer, as well as someone who is interested in supplements um, and being able just to learn from someone who owns a supplement company um, that's done some really great things. So thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it.